Well, I think that we can begin. Let us begin with the first session of this day. And uh, we will begin with the uh, Eric Surrey talk named Hasok Chang on acid, as you can see, like this. <laughs> and well, I remember you to uh, turn out, turn off your microphone. And if you want, it would be great if you can stay with your with your camera on so the speaker can feel that is talking to, to somebody and not to the void. Uh, I think that is, is very better for the talk, for the speaker. So you can, thank you. So Eric, thanks. Thank you very much, Olympia. Let me get started. So as you saw the title, Hasok Chang on acid, which I will explain if it needs explaining. Um, some, some preliminary comments. Hasok is, of course, one of the top historians and philosophers of science working today. Uh, one of the, the good things about his work is that he tends to focus on scientific details, on the, on the real science, if you like, and he doesn't withdraw into the more obscure and analytical aspects of philosophy of science. He is, of course, the author of several books, including Inventing Temperature, which won the Lakatos Prize. He is the author of a book called uh, Is Water H2O? Um, Hasok is also somebody who has more or less invented a kind of philosophy of science. He calls it complementary science. And the idea being that philosophy of science can actually contribute something to science itself, right? An idea that I am in complete agreement with. And um, having just a slight, yeah, good. Um, Hasok's PhD work, as you may know, was at uh, Stanford University, which is the home of the Disunity of Science School. I mention this because I'll be coming back to that thought because I think it's had an influence in the way he thinks about science and philosophy of science. He was trained as a philosopher of physics, but as you may know, he has made a number of what I would like to call excursions into chemistry. I am going to focus on one aspect of his work on chemistry, his work on acidity. The provocative title is intended literally because Hasok has written about acids and maybe more generally because I believe that Hasok may be hallucinating about certain aspects of acids. I should say at the outset that Hasok and I are, uh, have been friends for a very long time, almost 30 years now. And I intend this as a, a form of constructive criticism, and I hope he doesn't mind me launching into this. As I've already said, uh, Hasok puts a lot of attention on scientific details. He has worked in such fields as thermometry, the scientific revolution, electrochemistry. He's even repeated some classic experiments in some of these fields. However, and this is just my view, I believe that in some instances he may be imposing his philosophical views onto the science and perhaps being a little selective about which parts of science he chooses to focus on in support of his, his philosophical and historiographical views. For example, and now let me get to the point, Hassock believes there is a kind of rupture, a discontinuity, an incommensurability gap between the way in which acids were conceived by the Arrhenius theory of acidity and the Bronsted-Lowry theory of acidity on one hand, and on the other hand, the Lewis theory of acidity. For Hassock, there is a rupture that comes in once we move to the Lewis theory. 
Hasselt also rejects quite firmly the notion that Lewis's represents a genuine generalization of the two previous definitions. Just as a reminder of what these three definitions are, for those of you who may not be familiar with this, according to the Arrhenius theory, an acid is a substance that forms H plus ions in aqueous solution. So for instance, HCl is clearly acting as an acid here. The Bronsted-Lowry theory generalizes this by saying an acid is now any substance that donates H plus to any, any polar solvent, or even if there is no solvent. So for instance here, so-called acetic acid is actually acting as the base. HCl is acting as the acid, and the HCl is donating the proton to acetic so-called acid. Right. So it's a relative concept, acidity and basicity. Okay, the Lewis theory, the one that causes problems for Hassock, is that a Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor, such as the BF3 molecule in my diagram, and a Lewis base is something capable of donating a pair of electrons, in this case, ammonia. All right, what's the problem? A further example of acid base behavior a la Lewis would be this. Any transition metal ion combining with some ligands to form a complex ion, according to the Lewis definition, this is an acid base reaction. It does not involve H, of course. Hassock disagrees that the Lewis definition subsumes the earlier ones, as I already mentioned. And just to repeat, for Hassock, there is a rupture that's taken place on moving to the Lewis theory. I quote from one of Hassock's papers on the subject, I am almost inclined to say that the two concepts are incommensurable. It might be sufficient for present purposes to say that the Lewis and the Bronsted-Lowry definitions refer to two different sets of chemical substances. There is an overlap between the two sets, but one is not a subset of the other. He goes on to say, Perhaps the most popular story told by good chemists is that Lewis's definition encompasses the Bronsted-Lowry definition, that it is a generalization of the latter because a proton donor is also capable of accepting an electron pair. But I have my doubts about this, says Hassock. Consider the reaction of hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, which he presents in this way I've shown here. He goes on to say, but how would the same reaction be understood from the Lewis point of view? Does HCl accept a pair of electrons from sodium hydroxide? My response shown in red here is no, of course not. HCl or more specifically H plus accepts a pair of electrons from the OH minus ion, which exists in aqueous solution. He goes on to say, that is not obvious since the HCl molecule does not have an empty orbital into which to accept an electron pair. And my response, shown again in red, is yes, but H plus does have an empty orbital. It has an empty 1s orbital. He goes on. At any rate, nearly all of the HCl in infrastructure will be dissociated into H plus and Cl minus ions. So what must happen is that the H plus ion accepts the electron pair from the OH minus ion. Good. He, he seems to understand that. He seems to agree with that. But what then is acidic? Is the H plus ion not HCl as a substance or a molecule, which is contrary to the Bronsted-Lowry concept? Now, actually, according to the Bronsted-Lowry concept, HCl as a molecule, quoting Hassock, is not acidic. HCl is only acidic when it reacts with water. So what Hassock should have written for the reaction to make this clearer is HCl aqueous plus sodium hydroxide aqueous. In aqueous solution, H plus is present. H plus accepts of a pair of electrons from OH minus. There is no problem as far as I can see. 
as every high school student knows, HCl is not acidic in gas form. You can demonstrate this with the famous fountain experiment. You have HCl, you make it contract, the water rushes in, litmus turns red. That's it. You've identified the acidity of HCl in solution, not in the gas form, not as a molecule. Now, and there's another reason why Hassock doesn't uh, believe that Lewis is truly a generalization of the previous definitions. I quote, it's because Lewis acids cannot be quantified by means of a pH meter. And he quoting further from Hassock, at this point, there may be a strong temptation to get back to something more certain and sensible like measurement to anchor the meaning of acidity rather than seeking security in ever-changing theories. We do have a widely used measure of acidity in the form of pH, but I will argue that it is not a measure entirely fit for grounding the concept of acidity in its theoretical or empirical aspect. Right? So he accepts that there is a measure of acidity, pH meter, but he's saying we can't apply it to Lewis acids. Now, this is what I take to be putting one's philosophical views ahead of the science. And Hassock has a long-standing penchant for such things as pragmatism, operationalism, experiments in general. And as he's just stated himself, he has a certain disdain for theories because theories of course come and go. Another quotation, if you will indulge me further, from Hassock. pH only measures bronsted lowry acidity and has no clear connection to Lewis acidity. And then he says, this is of course understandable, given that the definition and measurement of pH by Sorensen dates back to 1909, more than a decade before Lewis articulated his theory of acids. Okay. But that's not why pH doesn't apply to Lewis acids. It's not because the, the establishment of the pH scale was done more than a decade before Lewis's definition. There's a very simple reason why the pH scale is inapplicable. pH measures H plus concentration, which is part of the definition of Bronsted and Lowry. Lewis's definition does not involve H plus ions. So why would one even expect it to be quantifiable through measurements of pH? A further quotation from Chang. History aside, this situation raises uh, a scientific and philosophical difficulty. Even if we assume that all bronsted lowry acids are Lewis acids, it is certainly not the case that all Lewis acids are bronsted lowry acids. Right? It's true one way, but not the other. There are Lewis acids that lack any precise quantitative measure empirically. I think this is a non sequitur. The fact that not all Lewis acids are bronsted lowry acids does not immediately imply that Lewis acids lack any precise quantitative measure. There are quantitative measures for Lewis acids. For example, so what if the acidity in the chromium three plus reaction that I quoted earlier or any complex ion formation cannot be quantified with a pH meter? If so, and it is so, you can't use a pH meter to quantify that reaction, so much the worse for the pH meter, right? It's not a reason, it's not a refutation that threatens the Lewis definition. A further quotation from Hassock. What does the degree of Lewis acidity mean, even theoretically? It would have to be something like the propensity to accept electron pairs, but there would be several different theoretical ways of making that notion properly quantitative, not to mention li linking those ways to performable measurement operations. This situation is unacceptable 
actually, there is a perfectly good way to quantify Lewis acids. Take the example I showed earlier of the chromium ion reacting with six cyanide ligands. We can, we can write a case stability term for it. The terms on the right-hand side are easily measured. Right? There is a quantifiable, there is a way of quantifying Lewis acids. As far as I'm aware, Hassock has never mentioned stability constants in his many writings, and he has several papers in which he talks about acidity. Or moreover, the same general approach, namely equilibrium theory, which is what you use when you do set up stability constants, of course, can also be applied to the earlier definitions, whether it be the Arrhenius definition or the bronsted lowry definitions. Um, yes, I get the fact that I'm five minutes away. All right, thank you, Olympia. Chang also quotes somebody called Bates, who has written the book on pH measurements back in the 1930s. Bates says, with the perfection of chemical thermodynamics, it became evident that Sorensen's experimental method did not in fact yield hydrogen ion concentration. The numbers obtained were not an exact measure of the hydrogen ion activity. I highlight the word activity and I will explain in a moment why I'm highlighting that word. Chang's comment on this is to say, all in all, the correspondence between the theoretical notions of acidity and the methods of its measurements has been and continue to be less than tight. Now, this term activity is of course a technical term in thermodynamics that I don't know, but it, it, it appears to me that Hassock may not be familiar with that term. Activity of course means if you want to measure the activity of compound C is equal to the concentration of compound C times the activity coefficient as shown in my formula there. It doesn't just mean acting as an acid as Hassock seems to believe, Right? Thermodynamic activity was a term incidentally introduced by Lewis to account for the phenomenon of hydration of ions and so something called ionic strength, which I will just briefly mention. What you do in thermodynamics is instead of using the equilibrium constant, the features concentrations shown here, the more correct way of doing this is to use activities in which you have these activity coefficients and these activity coefficients in turn can be calculated in the in this horrible looking equation here with a 305 term in the denominator and so on okay well, it's referring to the fact that whenever you have an ion in solution you have counter ions around it shown in my little picture here and so you have to take account of the size of the ion and its counter ion that leads to this discussion of activity. For example, the elementary definition of pH is shown in red here. pH is minus log of hydrogen ion concentration. But the real definition or the more accurate definition is that it's not, it's not what's shown in red. It is in fact the pH of the negative log of the activity of H plus. And this is all well understood. For example, for a 0 0.025 molar solution of HCl, it makes a difference. Not a big difference but a significant difference. Okay, this is all well understood in thermodynamics. Let me end by saying a little bit about chemical bonding and electron pairs. Lewis's definition of acidity is something, uh, a Lewis acid is something that accepts a pair of electrons. Right. Not only, I claim, is it a genuine generalization of the previous definitions, contrary to what Hassock is saying, but it's also part of a much greater unification that was initiated by Lewis. Lewis is of course famously remembered for having proposed the idea that a covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons. Lewis, as we've seen, also proposed the idea that an acid accepts a pair of electrons. So what Lewis did in this piece of work back in 1923 is that he unified our understanding of acids and bases together with our understanding of any reaction 
that leads to covalent bond formation. They all involve electron pairs. An acid accepts both the electrons in a pair, while, for example, if you react a hydrogen atom with a bromine atom, they do so by sharing a pair of electrons. To put it another way, dative bonds and typical covalent bonds are variations on the same theme. Lewis succeeded in unifying those two kinds of bonds. Moreover, all the subsequently developed quantum theories of chemical bonding, such as valence bond, molecular orbital theory, have maintained the notion of electron pairs. And just to mention as a, a detail, Lewis actually suggested that the opposite magnetic properties of electrons might be responsible for overcoming the obvious objection that two electrons in a pair are going to want to repel each other. And he did this before electron spin was first introduced. And I noticed that Juan Camilo is actually going to speak about the origins of Lewis's uh, thoughts on magnetism. Many of these ideas have been retained in some form following the advent of quantum theories. Electron pairs are of course retained in the notion of an atomic orbital, which can contain two electrons with opposite spins in the modern parlance. A quantum, a, a quantitative account of chemical bonding is of course to be had by considering electron exchange, which serves to stabilize a molecule, but nevertheless, the iconic idea of a pair of electrons remains at the heart of chemistry. I think Hasselk is uh, downplaying that whole development by objecting to Lewis's city in the way that he has done. And Lewis's idea was not confined just to inorganic chemistry, of course. It's been the basis of physical organic chemistry at the hands of people like Robinson, Ingold, Woodward, and Hoffman. All these achievements are indirectly right, undermined by Hassock in his sustained attack on Lewis acidity. So my suggestion is instead of looking at Lewis acids as failed acids, we should consider it the other way around. Lewis acids, meaning dative covalent bonding, form a subset of all types of covalent bonding. And like oxidation and reduction, the modern view of acids and bases transcends the lay person's view just because they may not sting when you put them on your hand and they may not be measurable with a pH meter, right? That's, that's the layperson's view. So an obvious question would be why all the nostalgia for acids in the layperson's sense of acids, which seems to be Hassock's view. So I, I now conclude quickly because I'm already slightly over time. HCl is not intrinsically acidic. It becomes acidic on reacting with water. It is perfectly consistent to consider H plus as a Lewis acid. Lewis's definition is a, gener a genuine generalization of the Bronsted and Lowry theory. There is no rupture. There is no incommensurability. Our inability to measure Lewis acidity with a pH meter is neither here nor there. Lewis acidity can be quantified by means of stability constants. Activity is a technical term used to characterize the non-ideal behavior of ions. It's a well understood phenomenon. There is nothing less than tight here. Electron pairs rather than protons are the key to understanding chemical bonding, either in Lewis structures, which are purely classical, Vesper theory, which is classical, or with, in the quantum mechanical theories. An acid-based behavior is just one kind of chemical reaction involving electron pairs. So what Lewis did effectively is to place acid-based behavior into the wider context of bonding in general. Lewis achieved a unification between acid-based reactions and bonding in general. Perhaps Hassock should focus on unification rather than claiming disunity and rupture. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Eric. Well, we are open to the questions. Remember to write a queue in the chat. So I received the questions, not the questions, but the, the order of the question and I can give you the 
possibility of asking in the same. I have a question, Guillermo Restrepo. Okay, thank you, Eric, as always, for your nice talk. Um, and you mentioned something, and, and I don't know whether I missed that part, but you mentioned that uh, the fact that uh, Hassel studied in Stanford has to do with the way you see things. How is that? Well, because he sees disunity where other people see unity. He sees rupture, he sees incommensurability. Hassock is also uh, something of a disciple of Thomas Kuhn. I see parallels between, and, and it's not just me, and, and he, he publicly acknowledges this. There is a lot of Thomas Kuhn's idea of incommensurability. If you remember one of the quotes, he actually uses the word incommensurability between the Bronson Larry definition and the Lewis definition. I don't believe there is incommensurability either here or in general. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, where while people think in different ah, a, a comment from Farhad. Hello, um, Eric. I enjoyed the talk. Uh, I think that the this sort of the the uh, focal point of your critique, one of them could be the issue of. Uh, uh, overemphasis on technology, on instrumentation. Um, and so from the point of view of instrumentation, there is a disruption, but that only goes so far. It does. And, and I would say not, sorry to, to, not even that, because there is instrumentation that can be used to measure the concentration of those ions in the, in the way I present it, you know, the stability constants require technology to measure concentrations. Well, certainly, I mean, not that no technology is available, but the technology of the pH meter has yeah. been succeeded. And yeah. you could say there's some, you know, you could do a uh, evolution of technology study just to uh, really analyze the continuity or discontinuity between pH meter technology and what you're just talking about now. Yes. Uh, if there is some discontinuity that you could justify, it would be found in that um, the trajectory of uh, developing technologies. But I oh. think you demonstrated pretty well on the theory side, it's not really, you can't maintain a, a rupture as you've, as you put out, I think. Sorry to insist on the point, but not just on the theory side, even on the experimental side. A pH meter measures H plus concentration by definition if an acid doesn't produce H+, such as Lewis's acids, then why would we want to use a pH meter? Why would you expect a pH meter to work? Right? It's, it's, it's a non-starter, in other words. And for, for Hassock to point out that this is a limitation, I find absurd. Well, what do other people think? Do, do you agree? Do you, do you think I'm being unfair? Is, is Klaus there yet? Klaus wrote a paper with with Hassock on acids. I was hoping he might be able to come in and comment. Well, let us continue with the questions and then we can go to the room and chat about this. I have some comments, but I'm the chair, so I can't. So, Sheriff. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric, for a great talk. Um, and um, I have a, a comment and a quick question. The comment first, I thank you for uh, underscoring the importance of using activity when you define pH, it is not the concentrations as every textbook in chemistry says the pH is minus the logarithm of the concentration of hydrogen ion. That's wrong because you cannot include in the argument of a logarithm or an exponential function something that has units. You are teaching this, this something wrong when you say that this is the concentration of hydrogen ion, um, uh, that, that this a logarithm of the concentration of the hydrogen ion, which has units in it as a baggage. How can you have 10 to the power 10 elephants? You know, it makes no sense. <laughs> you know, it just, it's just ridiculous. So I thank you very much for underscoring this important point that is overlooked in a lot of chemistry, uh, first year chemistry textbook type thing. And the second thing, have, have you come across uh, in your readings or 
in this field, anybody has used the Qtame in order to quantify Lewis, uh, Lewis acidity, basicity kind of thing, which is iconic. For example, it's in on the cover of uh, Bader's uh, book. You know, you have the well where the Laplacian, where you have lumps in the Laplacian. Um, that corresponds to the electron donor groups and and and, and holes in the Laplacian that, uh, in other words, local deficiency in in, uh, in the electron densities that accept these these lumps, and it corresponds one to one to what the chemists um, have as uh, Lewis acid base bond formation kind of thing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, on your first point, you're right. Most elementary chemistry textbooks give the the version involving concentrations. But you have, we have to remember that for dilute solutions, that's okay, right? Yeah, but it's not in principle okay. It's in, a, 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 the number is okay. When you take the number from the calculator, fine, but, but it provides the wrong idea to the student. I, I agree with you completely. It's a stumbling point that comes up every single year when one teaches this, right. On your second point, I, I'm not aware of that work. You, of course, are an expert in that field, and I'd be interested to hear more about the quantification of acidity using such things as Bader's methods. You say that you can actually picture it and quantify it. Is that correct? Yeah, it's not my area, exactly this one, but I am very familiar, of course, with Qtame, but, but uh, there is tons of work. Uh, perhaps even Sukumar can May may have had some contributions in this area. I don't know, but uh, it's I a well. Like to continue the chat in the room because we have one more question. Right. Very yeah. okay. because we are on the, on the time. Very short question from Jute. <laughs> What is this music? <laughs> okay, yeah, no, very, very brief. I mean, I found that very interesting that you present uh, Hassock as a philosopher who seems to be unduly influenced by a philosophical preference and thus even um, overriding the uh, experimental or empirical uh, focus that he has otherwise. And um, would you agree that, that this is what exactly happened here? And I, from the little I know about acidity, uh, I completely agree with you. It was, I think, utterly convincing. And uh, as was the demonstration that here a philosophical preference plays an undue role. Thank you. Uh, yes, that, that's exactly what I'm claiming. And I'm saying he is known for his attention to scientific detail. And yet, on this point, I would be very, very interested. I've not, I've not presented this to Hassock, and maybe he's on the YouTube channel and can respond at some point. I will eventually publish the paper. I am eager to know how Hassock would respond to all of this. He, he is not, in this instance, really attending to the scientific details. Mm -hmm. I plan to, I plan to eventually look into other areas that he's written on in his what is. Uh, H2O book, he makes a number of similarly provocative claims, such as that phlogiston should never really have been given up because it was productive or it would have been productive. It would have led us to the discovery of electrons sooner than we discovered them, for instance, which is a rather Whiggish claim, by the way, because you can only say that because we now know what electrons are. But that's another story. But that's that's another line of development. He's okay. I will. I, I would like to close with a comment coming from Eugen, who has problem with his microphone. It's a very short comment. He he says Eugen Schwartz says the issue may be connected with the fact that many chemical concepts are felt by chemists that are being useful in a fuzzy and multidimensional sense. Many chemical concepts are not linear, but multidimensional, such as aromaticity, oxidation, elements, etc. Thank you, Eugen. And, and acidity, presumably. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.